Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. Uh, Lord, I ask that you bless our time. Uh, we thank you for technology that can bring uh, a couple of people together from across uh, quite a distance. So I ask that you bless this time, help us to continue to grow um, in your word and our thought toward you, um, toward this world, uh, but also um, grow in community even, if, uh, even um, with distance. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, so we should all have uh, three documents. If not, well, at least I'm going to have them up on the screen as well. Um, but what we're, today is going to be a little bit more um, uh, kind of introduction, kind of getting things going. Uh, I know that sounds kind of weird talking to you when it's yeah. like trying to talk to the group. Um, but uh, it'll be a little bit of an introduction, some reading, um, but we'll get this moving forward. Um, so we can dive into this uh, the next few weeks. Um, on the website, it has the next the, the dates that it's going to be. There's a couple off dates because of your midterms, um, and then trying to end before your finals, just so you guys have a heads up. Um, but we're going to work our way through um, this introduction and this study. So first, uh, beyond there being a study once a week, um, what I've done is I've created a resource that is um, weekly and every day. Um, and so before I even, we even look at what that resource is, we're going to explain it um, by looking at the, the how-to guide. Um, if you guys can, um, can you guys see this? Okay. Okay. Um, if not, I'm sure Ben could, could open it up somewhere else too. Um, the idea is that we're not just trying to fit our faith into um, 40 minutes once a week or 40 minutes and then one hour on a Sunday morning. Um, as we as we can come alongside students um, to, to kind of engage in their faith every day um, with different rhythms. So I call them rhythms um, of faith. And so we'll read through this really quick so you guys get an idea what this is. Um, so who would be willing to read the first paragraph? All right. Maddie's going to read it. Uh, daily rhythms. We all have rhythms of life, some purposeful and some accidental, as we live our, out our lives. For example, we wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, shower, and brush our teeth, and then we have a rhythm of work or class that we attend. We also have weekly rhythms. For example, most people work and have classes Monday through Friday, and then rest on Saturday and Sunday. Perhaps people run errands on Saturday. Keep going. Keep going. Sometimes the concept of rhythm is lost in our faith, in our faith world. We might have a weekly rhythm of attending church on Sunday morning, but for the rest of the week, we might not think about rhythm of life and faith. Yet, as with the rest of our life, our spiritual life, which encompasses our whole life, needs patterns and habits. These nourish, feed, and inform our faith. I've laid out a simple daily rhythm for you. <laughs> So just read the paragraph. Okay, yeah. Um, it is made up of prayer, scripture, meditation, and teaching, and reflection. I will provide each week a morning prayer and an evening prayer. Each you can use as a resource each day. There are also either a scripture reading, a teaching meditation, or a reading from a historic theologian to engage you in to engage in on your own time that day. In addition, perhaps you eat before your evening prayer, there's a time for a reflection. Reflection is important as it allows you to consider God's word and or the teaching you read, as well as your life and experience that day. It's an opportunity to reflect on what Jesus is teaching you. You scan the horizon of your day, consider where there is need to turn away from an area of your life contrary to what Christ desires for you. His word convicts you and turn toward him. His forgiveness and a renewed life of love toward God and others. These events or experiences during the day can serve as a time of repentance and learning are called Piero Kairos. Kairos events. Can we do the next one? Sure. Give you a yeah. <laughs> Weekly and yearly rhythms. Just as there are daily rhythms, there are weekly and yearly rhythms. For the purposes of this, only weekly rhythms are involved which consists of the live Bible studies on Wednesdays at 8, and also weekly worship at a local church. 
Lastly, first, this may seem like a laundry list of to-dos or even a syllabi. However, it is helpful to think of it within the context of relationships. These are all means to be in relationship with God. We seldomly complain to hang out with the closest friend we have. We seldomly labor over the idea of communicating with someone close to us. These are opportunities to spend time with God, our Father. These are manners in which we communicate with God, and even more, how he communicates with us and spends time with us. Second, we will never do the rhythms perfectly, and there will be days and weeks where we fall quite short of them. However, like the rest of life, having the intentionality and the discipline to work toward it will benefit our faith in our journey of following and depending on Jesus. God bless your journey. All right, cool. Thank you for reading. Um, did everybody hear that okay or could read that to some degree? All right, cool. Um, if you want to go turn again, I know, like I said, this is a little laborious, but that's okay. Just so you explain it, because after explaining it tonight, we won't have to really talk about it except reflect on it, okay? Um, so what I've laid out here is what you'll see is, is you, as we read, there will be mornings and evening prayers for everybody, mm -hmm. okay? Um, oops, no idea what just happened. Okay, all right, cool. Um, and then starting the Thursday, so the day after the, the, the study, mm -hmm. is where there's going to be some resources for everybody that they can engage in. No one's monitoring you, like no one's checking in, and, and no one's like big brother and mm -hmm. anyone. Um, but this is um, an opportunity for you and resources for you. Um, so you're going to be reading scripture that kind of complements whatever we're talking about on a Wednesday night throughout the week as a follow-up, as a reinforcement. And there's some key um, questions for reflection. Um, and you'll see this every single day. There's a reading from a church father. There's the Every day there's going to be those reflection questions um, to be purposeful and intentional and, and so forth. And then um, another scripture reading and so forth Sunday presuming you guys are going to worship or that could have happened on Saturday. Some of this is flexible. Um, that will be your time with God there. And it just continues all the way up until Wednesday where you'll finish with a psalm and then we'll see each other on Wednesday evening. Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, you fit it in. The idea is like, I'm not in control of your class schedule. Thank God. Um, <laughs> but you guys can know where you can fit this in naturally and organically, whether that's in the morning when you wake up, um, at lunch, between classes, um, where you find times to just simply rest is when you can fit some of this in. Um, I know you're reading a lot of books probably, um, but again, the idea is if you're reading scripture, think of it more in terms of this is God's way of communicating with you. Um, he's not here in the flesh speaking directly to you, hanging out, but he is through his, his physical word um, that we get to read and engage in. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Any thoughts? Any, any concerns? No? All right, cool. All right, so that can take us, we can get into our week one um, looking at um, a couple different things, and we can start engaging in on this. Um, so if you guys can turn to that, it's all maybe up on the screen. There we go. All right. So I'm calling this study uh, the GPS cores. I think you guys know, and maybe maybe what you know, uh, that uh, we have a certain um, pathway in terms of our discipleship of following Jesus. And um, that is gather, prepare, send, and just kind of fun that it's GPS. Um, and so kind of as a foundation, um, looking at uh, some of the core theologies of Luther, um, you know, that's kind of the heritage that we're, we're born from um, in the Lutheran church, um, being able to look at the core of that. And that's going to tackle some big topics. Um, it's going to be tackling the kind of like life itself, um, identity, humanity, um, and obviously we can't encompass everything. We can't um, get into it, but it helps us kind of get into the frame of, of mind in terms of thinking like Luther and what he was going through and, and essentially we would kind of birth 
four centuries of theology, um, so to speak. So that's why I said it's going to be an in-depth look at the core of humanity faith and God through the lens um, of Luther. And believe it or not, this is going to start with the, the basic question, what is a human? And we're going to open that up for a conversation. And this might seem like a strange uh, place to start, especially for uh, a study or looking at theology. Uh, but really in context, this question, especially uh, what Luther might have been going through in real life, um, is what led him to think even beyond it. It was kind of his starting point, at least in his experience, trying to wrestle with himself, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So just an open open question, anybody can answer what? What is a human? If you were to try, if somebody came up to you and was like, boom, what's a human? How do you define a human in um, two words? I'm just joking. But in uh, a couple sentences, how would you, what would you say? This is open for anyone. Except my cat. That pins are grass. <laughs> oh, okay. um, um, yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want to give it a shot? Just start no wrong answers right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. I get. Have you taken anthropology classes before? Have you taken anthropology classes before? Okay. Gotcha. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say like homo sapiens for sure, obviously. Um, but then on top of that, I think because we're all human, like humans are like the life force that we can connect the most deeply with. Okay. Um, and I don't want to have like, um, our, our like, I don't know, like we're the only ones that like are, know are kind of connected to God. Okay. Can you guys hear this? Okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. That was a little strange. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts before we keep going? Okay. So some background and trying and this will we'll start to narrow this down into to looking at the time of Luther. Um, but I mean, if you look at history, on especially on a, a contextual level or philosophical level, since the time of Luther, um, we've kind of gone through two big phases. And I'm sure you've talked about this in class. One is modernity. Have you heard of that term before? And then postmodernity. Um, and if you really look at it, uh, modernity started right around the 1500s. Um, the turn of the 1400s into the 1500s. That was like the birth of it. And uh, we're not going to be able to define the whole thing of what modernity is. Um, but in short, um, in that era, especially what was happening leading up to the, the 1500s, uh, there was a certain way of looking at humans and defining humans, right? Um, that humans would have been defined as self ruling, okay, self sustaining. Um, they would have been seen as autonomous, um, and also that uh, uh, humans are defined by reason. That's a big one. And also moral um, aptitude and capability. So humans being self-ruling, self-sustaining, autonomous, um, having a moral aptitude and reason would all be allow them to overcome any circumstances or context. Right there, that's what the driving force of a human. Um, and modernity, especially this kind of view of human and reason, existed all the way through the Enlightenment. I'm sure you've heard of that. All the way up to where it started hitting, um, hitting the floor through the World Wars. 
right? Because if humans are have this capability, they have this reason, um, they're self-actualizing, and they have moral capability, then what would lead us to all the massacres, right, um, in, the, in the world wars? So post-World War II, um, just keeping it simple, gave rise to what would be understood as post-modernity. Um, modernity probably ended in the 80s or so forth, but post-modernity, which is, defines humans more as um, being uh, the sum of all their parts, okay? the sum of all of their experiences, the sum of their contexts, um, the sum of their, their cultural contexts, um, and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, the idea is in, in Luther's time, what Luther would have been growing up in, would have been influenced in, is thinking through humans uh, with a certain, like, uh, with a high view of humanity, okay? Um, a high view of the, their capability, of their aptitude, and so forth, their, their view of where they stand in, in relation to the rest of the world, um, and, and their ability within the, the moral scope. Okay, but Luther's problem, and this is where it all started, Luther's problem was how he, um, his experience didn't match kind of like the philosophical undertone, okay? So he, he kind of lived in a certain conundrum, okay? Uh, he, he couldn't escape um, sin, he couldn't escape torment, okay? Uh, he, he couldn't see himself as being self-ruling, I'll put it that way. Um, he didn't see himself truly autonomous because he couldn't conquer um, his sin or what was tormenting him. And in fact, he couldn't, with a uh, huge uh, role of penance in the Catholic Church at the time, where you're supposed to go and repent and think of all your sins and repent, um, he felt so under the influence of Satan and sin that he couldn't think of every sin that he committed to repent of. Um, okay, so. Here's this individual that can't rise above and, and match this kind of high view of humanity um, that kind of uh, pervaded the culture, but also the church at the time. Um, and this was actually this inner torment or this incapability um, was coined the term on factum, whatever, just throwing that out like a nerd, um, which is a German term for essentially trial or suffering and so forth. Um, so it led Luther to try to dig into, to understand himself, to understand his experience, like what is a human, okay? That was the starting point because by understanding what is a human, especially in his experience, he was able to ask a little bit further like, than who is God, um, what is God, who is God like, and what is God like, especially in view of, of myself. Um, and what I'm truly experiencing, especially in relationship to the world um, and to his, God's work. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's some like really, that's like a long background, um, but it's a really good foundational point if we're trying to like enter the mind of Luther. Um, and it's really helpful because we use a lot of Luther stuff in church. Maybe Ben uses a lot of Luther stuff in his sermons. Um, but Luther was human in the context, um, and like everything, when you're looking back at history, um, when you're looking back at works written 400 years ago, if you can enter into the mind and experience of the person as best as, best as you can and perfectly, it would be, be crucial. Um, so, if you want to turn the page. Um, Again, you guys are going to be reading a little bit more scripture throughout the week that kind of reinforces some of this. So I'm just trying to break this down um, as we, we engage in this and uh, think critically about it. Um, but the idea is that Luther, and, and kind of asking this question and um, digging into it and looking at scripture, um, he came across several things looking at Genesis 1 simply. I mean, that's if you want to start a scripture where you start Genesis 1, but looking at places like Romans chapter 1. Um, where it's talking about the righteousness of God and the righteousness of humans, and then looking in the Psalms, um, is that he started to become aware that there's actually kind of two things. One is that you can't ever have an anthropological understanding or a sufficient answer to the anthropological question 
um, unless you're also attributing or contributing from theology. So understanding the concept of God. Because humans are incapable of ever stepping outside of themselves to be able to define themselves. So humanity needs um, ex nos or outside in um, way of defining who we are. Okay, we can do the best we can. Over the past years uh, within modernity, we created different disciplines, such as, I mean, anthropology itself, but sociology. What are some other ones that are, are all disciplines to try to understand what human is? Like psychology, psychology, yeah. Psychology, <laughs> right? I mean, the list goes on, and we kind of, and they're helpful tools. Primatology. Primatology, right? They're helpful tools, but the idea is that it, they're always going to be insufficient um, unless we also bring in a theological framework um, and, and outlook to it, right? Or, or a filter as we engage in that. Um, what is the most neglected today? Here to bring today, right? The theological aspect or this high view that we're capable of being able to define it. Um, so, one of the longest standing definitions of what made humans unique was the fact that we have really organized culture. Mm -hmm. But now, with advances in primatology, we know a lot of primates have things that would be defined as culture. Mm -hmm. So, like ways of creating tools and stuff. So, it's it's become this conundrum of like, well, why why is ours? more advanced or why is it better how how is it better is it you know yeah so very good that's interesting so then um what we have here is what he started to realize is this high view of humanity which almost in modernity almost saw humans as like you know on one level having dominion um having rule um is that if you look throughout scripture as he looked throughout scripture he kind of saw a certain matrix where humans lived in essentially um, two directions. Um, and maybe you've heard this or talked about this, but the two directions is, especially if you have a theological framework, is, well then obviously, if there is a God and this God created us, then we have a vertical relationship, right? God isn't above us, but that's just a, an, an, an image that we can use. Um, a vertical relationship, and then obvious, which we most experience most often, so tangibly, is that we have a um, horizontal connection and relationship. So if you were to fill out the tops of and sides of these triangles, the top would be God. I can't type it in. Um, but the top would be God, and then if you would easily have a horizontal, what would fill those in? Just some thoughts. Others? <laughs> so one could be others or people. Okay, so God would be the top, um, but others and and people can be one. Um, uh, and this kind of goes back to Genesis one. What was the first task given to Adam? What was it in relation to? Take care of the earth. Animals. Yeah. So creation in the world. All oh, right. Okay. So the broadly creation in the world. And then people, once Eve came into the picture, and so forth. Um, so humans, we we kind of see, and also not not just in scripture, but in, um, uh, but also in his experiences. If you were to try to start to synthesize an anthropological matrix, is that um, again trying to put it in a framework that humans live in two directions. Um, vertically with God and then horizontally with creation, the world, and then with with other people, with, with humans. Okay. So we're going to dig into this a little bit more. You can turn the page uh, just a little bit more. And we're going to get it after this a little bit deeper. Um, I have no, oh, there we go. All right. So according to Luther, he said, where, where it needs to start is this. If there is a God, and we have that framework, and God obviously defines us a certain way, that we have to be dependent and, and reliant on how God defines us as revealed in Scripture. Um, and on top of that, if, we, if there is a God that created the world, he created us. So first and foremost, we are creatures. 
Okay, we're, we're creations, we're creatures. Okay, and Adam in the, in the um, garden, did he have any capability or moral aptitude or self-ruling ability to create himself? No, oh, right? Not to create himself, um, made by phrase outside. Oh. Um, so, I'll be back. the idea is that a creature being completely made with no capability on their own uh, has a certain amount or it is defined by dependence on the creator. So, even from the origin, even from the creator, Obviously, even before awareness, there is a dependence um, on the creator. And um, in fact, Luther said, one of his quotes, and it's just going to be a rough quote, that anybody that understands to, to first and foremost see ourselves as creatures, as created creatures, um, that is completely dependent on God for everything, including our very existence and everything that comes into this created world for us, um, is smarter than any university professor. Um, meaning you can have all the knowledge, right? But that's the idea is that if, if you are capable or if you understand or you know that um, first and foremost you're a creator and you're dependent on everything being from, from God, from your creator, what's up, man? Um, then you are going to be smarter than the university professor. You can have a seat, dude. This is Trey, everyone. Sorry, it's not a word. Yes. All right. So, um, we have this idea of dependence, and that leads us to kind of jumping ahead. Um, when we hear in, in the New Testament in particular, um, this idea of uh, faith. How have you defined uh, faith before? How have you guys ever defined faith? Say that again? No, just define faith. If somebody say, what is faith, what would you say? Okay. Okay. Um, so I kind of heard two things, um, believe or cling to. Do you guys have any? I know you're just jumping in. <laughs> There's a lot going on. But if somebody were, if you were to have to define faith to somebody, what is faith? Concretely proved, I guess. Okay. In some ways. Um, Okay. No, there's, there's just you trusting that something will happen or... Are you guys hearing this? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you're just trusting in something that um, will happen that, okay. um, or some like non-universal truth, I guess, that, that other people, you know, I don't know, there's, there's, there's I'm just... Not <laughs> well, so, no, that's good. So the idea is, um, and this is really hard for us, um, is we sometimes think that faith is something that is a word or a concept that has taken place post-creation um, and post the fall. Mm -hmm. and, and in particular, post-Jesus, um, mm -hmm. okay? But to properly understand faith, and we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit more, is that Adam, when he was first created, as a human, he was created with faith, okay? Even the fact, even though God walked with him in the garden, that's part of, part of Genesis 1 through 4, God walked um, with him in the garden, even though there was a perfect relationship, um, Adam still had faith. Faith wasn't a post-broken world um, experience or concept. Um, because it, it takes a little bit more work for us to do that. A little bit more, uh, uh, it takes a little bit more uh, um, labor to define it because of now that it's a concept. 
it's not necessarily um, intrinsic to who we are. That faith simply is defined as, as I was saying, is dependence. Okay, so if you're looking at creator, pre, um, creation, or creature, um, there is an intrinsic dependence that exists. Um, and then with that is an intrinsic dependence um, for survival um, and within the, the creative world. So when we get to the New Testament and then we hear the word faith a lot and Jesus is defining it and explaining it, um, one great example is where um, there is, there's children, the disciples try to shoo them away, right? And uh, he says, no, let the children come to me. And he says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, right? So what is Jesus trying to get at? What is he trying to reveal about the concept of faith? Um, and these were like infants, infants, the toddlers. Um, what was he trying to reveal? And, and largely, if you look at it in that whole context, is really driving at faith as understood as dependence. It's simply, simply dependence on God. Because an infant and a toddler, for example, have, have no choice, right? They have no, they're not self-ruling. They're not autonomous. Um, they're not self-sustaining. Um, they have no moral aptitude. <laughs> Um, they have no reason, developed reason, but yet they're the pinnacle of faith because they embody dependence. Um, and uh, dependence on God, dependence on, I mean, even the, the mother and father. Um, but that Jesus is trying to reveal and restore this concept of faith that would have existed um, post pre fall with Adam and Eve. Pre fall with Adam and Eve that there's a sense of uh, dependence. So who are you at your core? And this is going to sound strange. Like I said, this isn't intrinsic to us. Who you are at your core is um, is your faith. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And I don't mean like just your belief system, even though that entails it. Um, but how you are, who you are at your core as a uh, human, how you define yourself as a human, is faith, is your dependence, um, and your dependence on God. Okay, this is how Luther um, was really driving at, and this was this is going to affect then his view of salvation, which we'll get into future weeks. I mean, if you can if you can own this and can understand this, then you're going to be able to understand salvation um, and how salvation works. Okay, and, and beyond. Who are you at your core? It's, it's your faith. I mean, how many of you um, would have or would have defined yourself, the core of humanity, the core of you, the core of what God intends you to be as a human in, its, in your totality is faith? Would you, would you have defined it that way? Right? Um, because I think, like I said, faith is a thing like it's kind of like this. We put it in a box and, and we say it's one aspect of who we are in our identity. Um, we say it's one aspect to our way of thinking or our worldview. Um, we might not think of it in terms ontologically, our very being, that God has always intended that who we are at our core is this dependence. Um, and if we understand that, then, um, like I said, that we are smarter than any university professor. Uh, that has all the reason and information locked up in their brains and so forth. So who you are at your core is um, your faith. So that's kind of looking at a little bit more of the vertical. Like I said, we live in two directions, the vertical. Who you are at your core is your faith. Um, and then just kind of a broad overview of that, um, how we would have thought. What he started to put into a system and express is then how do we perform um, on a horizontal level. Okay, how do we perform as humans? Because, yes, we're dependent, okay, but we're still living horizontally. We're still engaging. Adam and in the garden, we're still engaging in the garden um, with the world and with each other, right? You can't forget that, okay? Um, so what is the shape of human performance is a, is a way to put it. What, how do humans relate or how do they exist in the world, within the context of the world creation and also um, people and humanity. 
And really what he came up with and what he started to, to put into um, categories, if you want to put it that way, is that humans exist within four orders. Okay, four orders. I mean, um, some have all called them estates, um, but four orders. The first one, as revealed even in, in all the way back in Genesis, pre-fall, that humans, as they were created, um, with this, this first view of dependence, was created to live um, horizontally in four ways. Okay, the first one in four contexts or orders. The first one, they're families. I mean, sounds kind of similar to mundane. Um, makes sense. <laughs> I mean, uh, the one of the first things that happens is Adam is given, besides his task in the world, is given a wife, right? First is his family. Um, the second is what Luther would have said is the, the economic order, or um, I'll put it this way, like your jobs or your vocations. Okay, you exist in that world. Um, in that order or that estate. Um, the third one is um, government or the political realm. Okay, we exist as citizens. Now, this might seem like post-fall talk. So like there, there wouldn't have been government and laws and people breaking laws um, before uh, the fall. However, um, a, Luther held to a strong belief, take away the, just the specific term politics or government, that humans were created for perfect social organization. Okay, so if the fall never happened, there still would have been social organization, it just would have been perfect. Okay, um, so he, he still kind of kept that as a category, saying this was, we experienced it on um, maybe a broken level, but humans were always intended to live in this realm also in terms of defining government as like social organization. And then um, the fourth is uh, the, the church, <laughs> um, not the simply defined the institution of the church, um, but uh, the responsibility given to Adam um, to obey God, right? He was, his, his responsibility was to pass that over to Eve, okay? Um, and the idea was to live in that vertical relationship with one another horizontally, okay? That Adam would have lived, in, there would have been church in the sense of that connection with God and that being passed horizontally in community um, within the context of relationships. Uh, now, he would say and would have said and he did say that pre-fall, some of these would have crossed over, right? They would have crossed over. They wouldn't be so categorized. Um, but post-fall, post the broken world, um, that there's a, there's a separation to a certain degree um, within that. Okay. So uh, does anybody have any questions really quick before I move forward to, to conclude? Any, any basic thoughts on this, what I was just sharing? Do you vehemently disagree with Luther? Does it make sense to you? <laughs> Does this seem to make sense? You buy it? <laughs> you can buy it? <laughs> Do you think, I mean, like, in terms of, like, just looking horizontally, can you think of any, like, orders or realms or estates, whatever term you want to use, that humans exist within in responsibility toward one or toward toward the earth. Um, do you think there's any besides families, your job locations, the you know, economics, government, social organization, church or church um, and church, are there other orders in which humans exist? Broad categories. I mean, I'm just saying, like, our connection to, like, not necessarily each other, but, like, just friends. Do they count as family? Or so, yeah, so he would say, like, um, which is interesting, he started to define economics as broadly, like, hobbies, mm -hmm. friendships, and so forth, like that. 
um, which is interesting because the term economics doesn't sound yeah. uh, doesn't sound that way. Um, but the idea is that pre pre the fall, how God intended to like launch us into His creation as creature that's completely dependent was that we would have been able to perfectly live within these states, perfectly live in these borders. Um, there would have been no brokenness in families. Okay? Um, there would have been a, a perfect understanding of, um, our, of our jobs, of our locations, um, of our hobbies, of, of ourselves. Um, there would be uh, perfect social organization, perfect respect for, for leaders and so forth. Um, and perfect leadership. <laughs> um, and then fourth, uh, there would have been perfect church <laughs> because we would all have been in union with God and so forth. Um, and uh, how humans would have been able to operate in this perfectly is because of the perfect vertical relationship. There is a perfect dependence, okay? Um, a perfect awareness of dependence um, and even if they weren't aware, there was simply, it was, there was a simple dependence that perhaps um, was lost because Adam and Eve wanted to know more, right? <laughs> or, or started to think a little bit more highly of themselves. And that was exactly the temptation of uh, the serpent, right? To, he, God said, don't eat from this because you'll be just like him, knowing good and evil. Right, and so Eve takes it, Eve takes it to Adam, he eats it. Um, the idea is then, with that thought, is they started to think they could know more for themselves. <laughs> that they were capable of, of owning more, knowing more, discerning more, especially between good and evil, become more like God. Um, so maybe what we're experiencing, what humanity, how humanity has been defined for so long, um, in terms of capability, um, we're missing the point. <laughs> so maybe the, the more we think we're capable, the worse we are in our vertical relationship with God, and the worse we do, <laughs> right? Um, but the more perfect we are in our vertical relationship with God, understanding ourselves as dependent, um, the better we'll do um, horizontally. And... Uh, and that's not even getting the argument, is that even possible right now? That's, that's not even a question right now. Uh -huh. um, but it's kind of like this reverse view of um, ability. <laughs> um, maybe disability is more in line with how God um, has in mind for humanity. Um, so with that, this is going to be a big foundation as we kind of dive even deeper in future weeks and we look at this um, because this framework, this kind of um, process or procedure of looking at what is a human and so forth um, is going to be able to um, filter and frame as we get into other topics that Luther started owning in his writing and teaching and the issues you have with the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And so with that, um, as you saw in your resource or discipleship path resource. You're going to be studying Genesis 1 through 2. We talked a bit about it tonight, just kind of in, in conversation or in my speaking. And then also Galatians 1. Um, because in, for Luther, besides the book of Romans, um, Galatians, the book of Galatians was like Luther's cornerstone. It helped, it helped him so much in terms of thinking through humanity and God and the ways that we're talking about. And that's revealed a lot in his commentary to, to the Galatians. So um, what you'll get to do is read Genesis 1 through 2 and Galatians 1, and you'll, you'll read all of Galatians throughout the next few weeks um, as we go through this study. And then you'll be able to kind of like pull things in from Galatians that makes like in connections between what we're talking about and what you're reading throughout the week and seeing like, ah, I see, I see what Luther is getting at. I, I understand how he's thinking even a little bit more um, and so forth um, and beyond. So that's all I had uh, for this evening. But do you know have any other thoughts, questions, open conversation?
Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, and as you go about your week, something to think about um, that whenever you're en engaging in class or whatever, uh, I'm not saying you need to define yourself this way right now to a person that asks you, um, what's your name, who are you? <laughs> um, just kind of bring to mind what we talked about. Think about that for a minute. Or start thinking about your day or your weeks where you might, and I mean, I do it, where we accidentally kind of compartmentalize ourselves or our faith um, and how we start to self-talk or define ourselves opposite of faith. We're not even thinking of dependence as our primary way of defining ourselves. Um, meaning like there's really no way of, if faith is a, who we are at our core, um, there's no way of getting away from it. <laughs> like there's no way like hiding it or there's no way like putting it in a box or, um, you know, or locking it up inside. Um, so to speak. So um, my challenge for all of us, including myself, is to kind of think through our week each day that way. Think of faith and dependence as your core and how that would, would shape how you approach everything, including class or your teachers, um, that, that information that is being dumped into your mind um, or the crazy amount of homework that you have or upper division classes. Um, with that, let's pray. Um, I'd like to open this up for anybody to pray. If not, it might just be easier for me to pray. So unless somebody is compelled by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I think Luke is, is compelled over there. I'm joking. All right, All right let's pray. Uh, Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. Uh, we are your children, but uh, we are your creation. We are creatures completely dependent on you. Uh, as we wake up in the morning, as we lay down our heads uh, to sleep, uh, that uh, may we remember uh, our dependence on you, that everything comes from you, our life, our existence, all the things that we need um, in this life um, to exist in this world. Um, but even our salvation um, is dependent on you. Um, so uh, clear our eyes and our ears from all the distractions that would um, uh, want to work against our, that understanding of who we are at our core. Um, and, and remind us by your word and through your spirit um, who we are in you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. We're going to do communion. I'll see you guys uh, next week.